Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus. Well, it is time for us to fellowship in the word of God. This is a time that we are gathered together. As I said on last Sunday during our worship time, we are here for Jesus. We are in this room because we all agree that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. And since we have gathered together in the name of Jesus, let's just worship him in spirit and truth. And I tell you, we had a great time in our gathering in worship and in the word. Well, God is speaking to us, the body of Christ, the believers. This is a believer's message. This is a message for those who are already saved, redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And it is to encourage us. It's to challenge our faith. And so we're going to pray and hear what God is speaking to us through his word. Father, we thank you for calling us into a wonderful kingdom full of love, joy, peace in the Holy Spirit. Thank you for having the grace of God on our lives, the favor of God. Thank you, Lord God, for being able to be your witness in the earth, to be able to take this truth, this light that you have shined in our hearts through the gospel of Jesus Christ and be able to share this good news with others. We thank you, Father, for giving us understanding exactly what that looks like from the scriptures. And thank you for giving us the heart of faith to be able to be faithful in carrying out that assignment. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're talking about the great compassion. The Bible reveals in Psalms 116, verse five, has been our foundational scripture. The Lord is gracious, and righteous and our God is full of compassion. The God that we serve, Jesus Christ, the most high God is a God who is full of compassion. That means he will never run out of compassion. And we said that that compassion is the revelation of who God is in the midst of human experiences, both good and bad. Sometimes people say God is good when good things happen. Well, God is good when we have bad experiences and we get to get a revelation, an understanding of how good our God is. And then we say what it does. It brings humanity to a place of decision making in regard to the message and ministry of Jesus Christ. As believers, we can't save anybody. Hallelujah. We needed salvation ourselves. We needed to be saved. But our ministry is to be able, as Paul put it, to water into plant. And God is the one that brings the increase. Well, in our last lesson, if you didn't get that lesson, go back and listen to it on YouTube or Facebook. And we talked about what I call self-evaluation questions. And that's, those questions are personal and we have to be honest with ourselves. And not only did we look at self-evaluation questions, but we looked at three experiences uh, when the Bible speaks about entering heaven. And it's very important that we be real with ourselves by being real with the word of God and letting the word of God be the light that shines in all of our hearts. We said in that lesson that we as believers, we have to be willing to be proactive. We said we have to be willing to be sensitive and we have to be the solution and not the problem when it comes to sharing the great compassion uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ motivated by his love. Now, in concluding these series of teachings uh, of the great compassion, which is the foundation for the great commission, as I have said, I want us to consider wisdom nuggets in witnessing. Every individual who is a part of Jesus's mission in the earth to reach the unreached is called to witness, that is to share his good news with non-believers. In John 15 and 16, the Bible reads, these are the words of Jesus, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give it. There's some fruit that God wants us to produce that will remain. That means when this earth or this world is dissolved, the fruit is still uh, 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 active. The fruit is still alive. The fruit is still bearing witness to God's goodness. And I believe soul winning is being fruitful. I believe when we have a heart to reach others for Christ, we're willing to share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ that is a way in which we are fruitful and that fruit will remain. 
and even in our prayers, our prayers will be directed even in that avenue concerning the loss, concerning uh, God sending laborers into his harvest field. That will be part of your prayer life. That will be part of my prayer life. When your prayer life is just situational and selfish, uh, according to James 4 and 3, uh, 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 those selfish prayers, uh, the Bible says God don't respond to those prayers. Those prayers that's all about you and, and, and sinful pleasures and things, nothing to do with God. And we live in a world today where people want God uh, at, at their uh, 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 convenience. You know, when I want God to do something for me, I'll talk to him and I'll pray or, or I'll come to church when trouble get in my life. But there has to be a relationship that comes with a commitment to follow Jesus. And that's the people I'm talking to today. These series of teachings are not the kind that people go, you know, jump up because it's promising them something materialistically, uh, playing on their emotions. And No, these are the type of messages that challenge our faith. Does not condemn our faith, doesn't crush our faith, but does challenge our faith. And I'll say this, it charges our faith. That means it strengthens our faith and it channels our faith. It put our faith in action. James said faith without works is dead faith. And God wants us to have a, a living faith. Well, when you're willing to reach the unreached, uh, focus your faith on being faithful witness for God. That is, let your personal experience and encouraging meant through the love of God inspire others you are ready to be an instrument in the hands of God. However, you need to prepare yourself for those negative responses. When you decide that you're going to make the first, first step, you get ready because there are some wisdom nuggets that you and I need to have. And that's what I want to conclude this series with. Wisdom nuggets and being able to share your faith regardless of negative responses of others. First of all, it begins with this, to be a faithful witness. You want to be a faithful witness. I believe, turn to Acts chapter 26 because I think you will agree with me, those who know your Bible, that Paul, the apostle, was truly a faithful witness. And we see that all through his life and ministry once he became a born again Christian in Acts chapter 9 when he had that experience of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. But in Acts chapter 26, I want to pick up a moment in Paul's life when he is now desiring to go to Rome to preach the gospel, but through the process he's going to Rome as a prisoner. He's going through the legal formalities of that day. So he's going to stand before these kings, or we can say stand before these court system or judges. So in Acts 26, if you look at verse 28, Paul is sharing the gospel. He is being a faithful witness in a very negative situation in his life. Things are not going well for him. He's not living in luxury. He doesn't even have the freedom to go about as he so desired. But even in difficult times and challenging moments in his life, he is a faithful witness because a faithful witness is a faithful witness at all times. A faithful witness is not a faithful witness when it's convenient. Matter of fact, a faithful witness is more of a faithful witness when it's inconvenient. Because they're doing it by faith and faithfulness to God. So in Acts chapter 26, look at verse 28. This is the response of the king after hearing the gospel. In verse 28, he said, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Why? He's heard the gospel. Now he's not saying this as if though, I was almost about to cross over. I, I, you know, I was halfway there. No, he's been cynical. He's been sarcastic. He's making mockery of what? Of Paul's faithful witness, of the zeal of the 
excitement that Paul is reflecting the emotional zeal that Paul is showing forth in telling his story of his experience of God's saving grace. Now, there's some things about Agrippa I want you to understand. Paul is talking to Agrippa in such a manner because Paul knows that Agrippa, Agrippa knows the history of the Jews. He's familiar with them. So in Acts chapter 26, if you look at verse 23, when Paul first started talking to him, Paul said, especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patient. Paul is saying, I'm going to go back into my Jewish uh, uh, experience. I'm going to go back into my life story of what my life was like before I got a revelation of the, who Jesus Christ was and brought it and asked him to come in my life and forgive me of my sins. And so that he could reveal to me his will for my life. He said, you are an expert on Jewish custom. You are an expert on the Jewish people. So you know what I'm going to share is true. So he goes down and he began to say, my man of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know me. What he's doing? He's going back into his past. Listen, believers. Yes, God has saved us. Yes, God has forgiven us. But we got to remember that past life become a sounding board to take people into the new life we have in Christ. So don't allow your pride to make you feel like I don't want people to know about my past. Your past can become a tool that you can now use against the enemy. Just like he was using it against your life, you can say, I can use it against them now. Why? Because I can let sinners know, I know what it's like to live without God. I know what it's like to live in rebellion and disobedience. I know what it's like to live out of the love of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I know what it means to walk and live my life under the influence of the devil. I know what it's like. But I also know what it's like to be born again to come into the knowledge of the revelation of Jesus Christ and to receive his saving grace. So Paul begins from his past. Verse 5, they knew me from the first. If they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Paul said, I was a blind Pharisee. I was a religious Pharisee. So what do religion does fight against righteousness, fight against the Holy Ghost, fight against truth, fight against the word of God, fight against the will of God. That's what religious people do. And that's what Paul did in his past. He fought against the move of God. He fought against the power of the church being released out with the gospel of Jesus. He fought against the message of Christ. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. What he's doing? He's going down to the history of the Jewish people. Why? Agrippa is aware of this history. He studied it. He understands it. He want to make sure that he keeps some kind of connection there with the Jewish people for his own benefit now. For his own well-being. For the benefit of his, his country. So he goes on to this promise. Our 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day hope to attain for this hope sake King Agrippa I am accused by the Jews. Boy every Jew should read this particular witness here of Paul with a, a, a lens that reflect Christ. They got to look through a different lens. They got to look through the lens of the New Testament but they need to hear this story and see boy because Paul goes back to what? He goes back to the Old Testament patriarchs. All right, then he say, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Remember, he's familiar. He is aware of Judaism. He studied it out. He understands it. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That's Paul giving his story. This I also did in Jerusalem. Many other saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly engaged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. That's his story. That's what he did in his past life. He fought against Jesus. He didn't know he was fighting Jesus. He thought he was fighting against people. And people do that when they're religiously blind, fighting against 
<laughs> the will of God fighting against the direction of the church. The Holy Spirit is speaking to the spiritual leadership. And boy, they were fighting against it. Thank you, they fight, fight for Jesus. No, you're fighting against Jesus, and it's dangerous. While thus I occupied as I journeyed to Damascus, so he go down, you read chapter, Acts chapter 9, you'll see his story there. Look at verse 15. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will reveal to you. Listen, listen, this is his story. You should have a story, I should have a story. And what we do, we be able to share that story so that we can bring him into the truth. But look at verse 18, here's the key. He said, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What's that, the gospel? He's preaching Jesus Christ. He said, that was my calling, to go to those who are in darkness, to cause the light of truth to come to them. So they can be what? So they can come out of the kingdom of Satan and be translated over into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they can do what? Receive forgiveness of sins and the inheritance among all those who are sanctified by faith. Hallelujah. You've been set apart by faith. All right, so I just want us to see this. So Paul goes on in verse 21. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would be claimed like to the Jewish people and to the Gentile. Listen, that's the message. Paul said, I preach this message to the small and great. Don't be intimidated by people's status and position. Here Paul is sharing this testimony with the king, King Agrippa. He's talking to people of authority. And then he goes on. So here's what I want us to see. I want us to see, look at verse 26. For the king before whom I speak freely knows these things. Paul said, you know them. That's why he's speaking. He's not speaking to a king who have no background and understanding. You got to connect with people. He's connected with this king. And that is what a faithful witness does. How can I connect with the people that I'm sharing the gospel? That's why when people go over to foreign countries, before they go share the gospel, they learn the culture. They learn the language. They learn the things of how people relate in the culture. What's that? That's being an effective witness, a faithful witness. They're not just going over there to check off their mission uh, 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 budget that we went and we did this so we can get more money from the uh, uh, higher agents. See, no, they got a heart for soul. They want to reach people for Christ. They're willing to sacrifice the luxuries of living in America to go live in foreign countries because they believe that God has called them to carry the gospel into these areas of the world. And their reward is going to be great in heaven. And so often people look at them and say, I would never, I could never go and do that because God knew you would never do it. That's why he didn't call you. But he knows there are people whose hearts are ready, whose hearts are open to take the gospel to foreign lands, to places where they don't have the luxuries and the convenience and the nice things and the pleasures of this particular uh, 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 nation that we live in. But yet what they're doing, they're carrying out the will of God. So here again, Paul is being a faithful witness. And then in verse 27, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. In other words, you know that what I'm saying is true. Paul is letting him know. No, I know you know what I'm saying is true. What I am saying about the Jewish history, what I'm saying even about my former life, you are full aware of that. But here again, he brings him to what? An opportunity to hear the gospel. Because he said himself, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. He's being sarcastic, but look how Paul responds. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and all together such as I am except for these chains. In other words, I wish every one of you would have the experience of the saving grace of God just as I have experienced that. And, but I wouldn't want you to be experiencing these chains change that I am bound to, that I am innocent, people are lying, 
And, and Paul knew that they were lying. Paul knew that the charges they brought against him, they were false charges. He even made, made this statement in Acts 25 in verse 11. For if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to die. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. He appealed to a higher court in order to go ahead and plead his case. But I believe God is directing uh, uh, Paul in the way that Paul is going. Listen, listen. When God is with you, nobody can be against you. And all God called us to do is to be a faithful witness. Another wisdom nugget, I believe, is that you and I, we must have a soft heart but thick skin. Look at Acts chapter 18. I want to look at another case with the Apostle Paul. Well, he's a great witness. He's a faithful witness. But we have to have a soft heart but thick skin if we're going to reach the unreached. And Acts chapter 18, Paul is ministering in Corinth. Corinth is a very difficult city to take the gospel. But yet Paul is being led by God to take the gospel in that region. Notice his experience. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation. They were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Notice what he's doing. What he's doing. Carrying the gospel. Sharing the gospel. Engaging in conversation. Having dialogue. But his motivation is to reach them for Christ. Look at verse 5. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. That's the gospel. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. Look at verse 6. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from now on I will go to the Gentile. What is Paul doing? Paul recognized that these people here are not open to the gospel. It is wisdom that he's using. He's not in the flesh. He's directing his ministry in the way of the spirit of God leading him. He was, verse 5, compelled by the spirit. He's being led by the spirit. And when you are led by the spirit, opposition will come. People will, will come to try to hinder you. Why? Because Satan will come against a moving target. And when you want to reach people for Christ, the enemy will come against you, but he cannot stop you because God is with you and God is for you. And God sees that you have his cause, his purpose on your heart. And God's going to use you for his glory. And he's going to bless you and he's going to cause you to see the fruit of it. Look at verse 7. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. So he leave out of the religious camp and he goes over to this man's house next door to the synagogue. And the Bible said then uh, 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 Cyprus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Had Paul not had thick skin, he would have gave up he would have got discouraged. You owe me why they treat me like this and all that. But you got to have a soft heart and thick skin. Do what happened? He went to that man's house and preached Jesus and the man got saved. The family got saved. Other people got saved. In verse 9, now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. Look at that. God come and just recharge his faith. God come and just what? Reignite his passion to go out and share the gospel. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. Thank God that he had a soft heart and thick skin. That he didn't allow the little persecution to get him out of the will of God. And that's how people are today. They're in the church. They're sitting there talking with titles and all that. And they have, you know what? They got a heart full of pride. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because the first time you correct them, boy, that pride just show up. 
Talk about, I'm, I, I, your God has called me. But you can't take nothing. You don't have no thick skin. We have to have a soft heart, but thick skin. You look at Jesus' heart for the Jewish people, even though he called those uh, religious people, one on one occasion he called them a bunch of vipers. Told them that, you know, they, they, they would always reject the gospel. But listen at his heart right here in Matthew, uh, I think it's Matthew 23, 37. Listen to the heart of Jesus. Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as hen, protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you would not let me. That's the heart. That's, that's, a, that's a soft heart. Hallelujah. That's a heart of compassion. They are stoning the prophets. They're rejecting the message. But the heart of God is I want to love you. I want to bring you under my wings. I want to protect you. I want to nurture you. I want to care for you. That's the heart of God. Jesus, on one occasion, when he sent his disciples out in Matthew 10, 16, he said, look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves, so be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. Now notice, he put uh, 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 doves and, and, and uh, wolves, uh, uh, snakes, in the same category here. In the same category. So, so I call it, you know, snakes, snakes are very cunning. They have an objective, shrewd. They can sneak up on you, but they're very uh, uh, thoughtful. They're, they're, they're cautious. Uh, they contemplate, they think. And so Jesus used the illustration, uh, when you go out there, you know, he said, make sure that you are, uh, 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 I'm sending like sheep among wolves, be shrewd as snakes now, but harmless as dove. Be cautious, contemplate, be thinkers, be alert, have a goal. You know what you want to accomplish? You want to reach them for Christ? Don't let nothing stop you from your mission. But then he said doves. What's that? Gentle, sensitive, caring, honest, pure. So he said all that has to be in that heart. And I believe that's what a soft heart with thick skin look like. Doesn't mean you mean and nasty. It's just you're wise, you're sensitive, you're discerning, you're alert, you know your mission, you're thinking, but you're also gentle, respectful, kind, courteous, pure, honest, you have integrity. All that reflects what? The metaphor he uses of a snake and a dove. And so if we're going to reach the unreached, we got to be a faithful witness. We got to have a soft heart but thick skin. And we got to share the benefits of the gospel. That's very important. The benefits of the gospel. And I want to conclude with just sharing a few benefits that the gospel has. First of all, the gospel is the most valuable resource in the earth. It is what gives people eternal life. That's the value of the gospel. That's the benefit. It gives salvation. It gives eternal life. The gospel brings true transformation for the glory of God. Sometimes people say, I just want to change. I just want to change. But when you're in the kingdom of God, you want to change for the glory of God. You can live your life outside of Christ now you want to live your life for Christ. Paul, when he was changed, he was changed for the glory of God. That's why in his response to Jesus, it was, what would you have me to do? What is the mission? To be a minister, to serve. And I believe that's what God's called all of us, to be a minister, to serve. To be a minister means to be a servant. And if you're called into leadership and other capacity of the body of Christ, what is called servant leadership. Another benefit of the gospel is peace and joy. Hallelujah. <laughs> Romans 14, 17 said the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. That's carnal, religious, rules and regulations, but peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Another benefit is forgiveness of sin. Another benefit is covenant family and true fellowship. Oh, yes. 
God spoke a word to us this year. They're going to hear, but we're going to soar and not settle. We're going to enjoy a fellowship based on God's faithfulness, and we're going to walk in surplus provision. And I believe God spoke that word. Yeah. When the enemy come in as a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against them. Another benefit is faithful father and a provider. That's the benefits of the gospel. You get to be part of a kingdom where there is a faithful father. And the Bible says his name is faithful and true. And the Bible says even when we are not faithful, he remains faithful. Another benefit is security. Not only security in the sense that I dwell in the secret place of the Most High and I shall abide under his wings and I will say of the Lord, you are my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust, but we have eternal security. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The sufferings of this present world is not to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. And so we have security and we have eternal security and we have deliverance and freedom. These are what? The benefits of the gospel. It's more precious than gold and silver, just like your faith, according to 1 Peter. Our faith is more precious than gold and silver. The trying of our faith, the testing of our faith, the genuineness of our faith. Another benefit of the gospel is that we have a hope. The Bible calls it a blessed hope. Hallelujah. We have a hope that the world don't have. All of these are the benefits of the gospel. And when we begin to reach the unreached, we know that God has put it in our heart, this great compassion, this great love for sinners, this great love for the unreached, the lost, those who don't know Christ, is it, it reflects in our prayers. We are praying that the Lord of the harvest may send laborers into his harvest, and we are willing to be the ones who go and represent Jesus in the harvest field. And so now God is speaking to us. We are called to be a faithful witness. And I want to encourage you because sometimes people are discouraged of how people may respond to the gospel. Remember, we are not responsible for how they respond to the gospel. We're responsible for making sure that we are sharing the gospel. Paul turned away from those Jews who were rejecting the gospel. Why? Because he's not responsible for how they respond. That blood is not on his hand. He's done his part. They've rejected it. But God knew there would be some people who's open. So right there, when Paul turned away from those who were rejecting the gospel, he was able to find those who were ready to receive the gospel. And so we got to be a faithful witness. The Bible says, faithful man shall abound with blessings. Well, when you become a faithful witness, you're going to see blessings just come into your life. And then we got to have a soft heart and thick skin. Stop being a person who allow your emotions to rule you. Because if you're going to be a witness for Christ, you can't allow your emotions to go out there and you get all offended. You get in the flesh. You get mad at people. You out there protesting in an ungodly way and all kinds of stuff like that. We got to have a soft heart, but we got to have thick skin. You got to be able to know that they're not really doing it to me. They're doing it to Jesus. Hallelujah. Paul, they thought, Paul thought he was fighting against the believers. And Jesus said, you're fighting against me. And get this, and you will never win. So why don't you get on the winning team? Paul got on the winning team. He joined Jesus' team. And then he became a great witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we got to be able to show that we can share and we're willing to share the benefits of the gospel. The gospel is good news. If anybody's trying to scare you into uh, giving your life to Christ and putting fear in you and all this kind of stuff and talking about hell, I want to talk about heaven. Hallelujah. I want to talk about heaven. Why? Wow. Because that's another one of the benefits of the gospel. People get to have an opportunity to go to heaven and be eternally with God. Well, I have a few faith action questions. The first one is this. What zeal will you add to your salvation experience in sharing it with others? Man, I tell you what, I'm sure King Agrippa saw the zeal, saw the emotional joy in Paul sharing his experience of becoming a born-again Christian. And man, when you share your story, 
the people you are sharing it with, they can look at your your uh, uh, attitude and, and, and your emotions and your actions. They, they see the joy. They see the excitement. They see uh, uh, the, the fact that you want them to have the same experience. They see your zeal. Another question is this. What will you do with the emotional experiences that comes with sharing the faith? All oh, people talk about, you know, I got church hurt and all these things, but you don't see them doing anything for the Lord. You know, they're going around, well, look at my wound. Look what they did to me. Look, well, what are you doing for Christ? What testimony can you give that shows the good news, the gospel, rather than you going in trying to get somebody else to do what you did, left the church, or you mad at the church, and you don't want to see the church prosper. You don't want to see the church do well. Anything ain't negative. You make sure you want to be aware of that. Well, I tell you what, you need to check yourself if you call yourself a Christian because you may be that part of those persons that when you think you're going to go to heaven, you have been deceived by the devil. You have been deceived by the devil. When you have a heart for God, you're going to have a heart for the body of Christ. And even those who may be walking contrary to God's will, you will pray for them. You'll hold people accountable. You will be honest with people. You'll deal with people. Don't worry about, well, you know, you know, they're a minister. I don't want to tell them the truth because they might leave. They're going to leave anyway. If you think that way about any member of your church as a pastor, you, there's a reason you think that way. There's something going on, and you just need to pray and say, God, you know what, God? I'm perceiving this, but I want you to be the one to deal with this person. You deal with their heart. And if they try to sow a speed of a period of confusion, if they try to come in and operate with a wolf spirit, because remember, they look like they had sheep clothing, but that could be a wolf with sheep clothing. That's what the Bible says. So you let God deal with them. I'm telling you, I'm a great witness. God will deal with them. And, uh, and, and you'll keep your heart free from that because you got the love of God in your heart. Amen. If they all up in your heart and they leave, they took a part of your heart. No, you have God first and foremost in your heart. Well, let's go on. Another question is, what will your benefit plan look like in sharing the gospel? What are things you're going to share with them about the benefit? Don't go out there with that foolish uh, material stuff. No, that's not the benefit of the gospel. Do, say, what, say what the Bible said. Yeah, all these wonderful benefits we got, we don't have to go into the carnal closet and get stuff out that we like little toys. And, and, and people could tell you that straight up, I ain't got to listen, you know, take, get the gospel to get those little toys. No, you don't need the gospel to get those little toys, but God wants to give you something that has eternal value. Hallelujah. You can't buy peace. You can't buy joy. You can't even buy healing. Hallelujah. Doctors will tell you, ain't nothing we can do. But God is a God who said, I sent my word and healed them and delivered them from all of their destruction. Is a God a faithful God? Well, I know you are encouraged and inspired, and I know if you have not been a person who ever had any intentions of ever sharing the gospel of Jesus, sharing your story, praying and reaching somebody for Christ. Could be for various reasons. Could be that you never felt like you could do it. You may have felt a little timid. You may have felt like, well, I, I don't feel I know enough. Remember I said last Sunday, make that first step. Make that first step. Just like a baby, that first step is going to lead you to many more steps. Then you're going to stop stepping. You're going to start running. You're going to start moving in the things of God. But we must do it knowing that the mission of Jesus Christ when he came in the earth, he came to die for sinners. He came to seek and save that which was lost. That's the mission of Jesus. That's the mission of the church that says that this is a church where Jesus Christ is Lord. Then we have to make sure that his mission is magnified. We are not called to build an attractional church so we can just get more people in, so we can stroke our ego or whatever. But we are called to equip the saints so they can go out in the harvest field and begin to be the light of the world and salt of the earth. That is the mission of Jesus. That is the mission of his church in the earth. Well, I know you've been blessed by the word. I want to thank you for joining me for these teachings. I'm excited about what God is going to open up us next and take us into because he is feeding us his message from his word because we are part of his wonderful kingdom, the family of God. Well, God bless you and have a great day in Jesus' name.